from the valleys of Tennessee and breaking through the barriers of perceived reality. You have now crossed over to the far side. And on today's edition, we have on Deborah Moffat and Todd Hendrickson. Deborah Moffat has a book out called A Deadly Haunting. And you can find that book at thefarside.tv slash deadly haunting. Welcome to The Far Side. Thank you, Bob. Oh, thank you. It's great to have you both here with us. Deborah. your story, it, it actually began in 1984 without you, but your story began in 1987. Is that correct? That's correct. That's when I actually start experiencing the paranormal for myself. Mm-hmm. And would you mind just giving the audience a bit of background on information on what happened in 1984? And that, that way we can progress. Certainly. Well, in 1984, now this is all that was told to me because I wasn't in California at the time. Uh, my husband's mother's mother, his grandmother, uh, was dying and she had to have a housekeeper to take care of her 24 hours a day. And they hired a, a Guatemalan ho- a housekeeper. Um, she took care of my uh, her, his grandmother. Um, she didn't want anything to happen to the grandmother because if uh, the grandmother died, she lost her job and she was going to have to go back to Guatemala, which she didn't want to do. Now, from what researchers in later years deduce from things that my mother-in-law told them, they believe that she practiced some type of Santeria and she opened some door that allowed this entity to come through. Um, like I said, she didn't want my mother-in-law's mother to die. Uh, so she, I don't think she did this with any type of malice. She just tried to use her magic to, to keep her alive, which she didn't. The lady died. And the day that she died, the lady, uh, uh, her name was Juanita, uh, ran down in the middle of the night to my mother-in-law screaming in fear, told her, don't go back up to the house that they were living in. These houses were right next door to each other, um, that there was something evil and to stay away from that house and that she was sorry. And like that next morning, someone came and picked Juanita up and they never heard from her again. When my mother-in-law was cleaning out the house, she found a paraphernalia that made people believe that this lady was into magic. They found, she found blood, feathers, broken rosary beads, candle wax, and that's what they believe happened. That's how this all started. What is Santa Maria? What kind of magic is that? Um, it's a combination of Catholicism and voodoo. Yeah, it's actually uh, derived from West African uh, religious practices. Yeah, it's, practic- it's pretty much just that uh, combination of... Uh, it's really more of, of the original West African uh, religious practices with a, a kind of a facade of uh, Catholicism to it. It's uh, the worshiping their gods uh, through the, the visage of saints to mask their practices. Would it be sensible for me to say or ask this person who was trying to save this other person but had died that maybe her magic worked and their spirit stayed around causing problems for you i I don't personally don't believe that i don't believe that what we experienced had anything to do with the grandmother other than her participation in the beginning the ritual to allow this to come through i don't believe this was a human spirit okay Todd, how did you get involved? Oh, um, actually, I heard a little bit of Debbie's story before I met her. Um, her family is friends with my girlfriend's family. So I, I heard a little bit about the story when Debbie finally told um, my girlfriend's mom just a bit about it, and it got handed down to me, and it struck my interest. Um, I've been a researcher for quite some time, and there were some really extraordinary claims. So I, I set up a meeting with Debbie. And I, I read several of your articles, and what you were writing, showing, was quite interesting. So, Debbie, take us to when you moved into the house. That was 1987? Correct, 1987. The houses that I, and I'm talking about are three houses right in the row on a corner. Um, the first house on the corner was my husband's house that he inherited. The next house over was my mother-in-law's house. Now, this house... Um, I lived in, my husband lived in, my mother-in-law and father-in-law. We lived together because my husband had a heart condition, and he was very close to his family, so I felt very comfortable with the four of us living together. Then on the other side of my mother-in-law's house was the grandmother's house, so the three houses were right in a row. 
What happened when I came in 1987, they were already renting out the grandmother's house. My husband gave me a little inkling of certain things that were going on, nothing major. Uh, the gentleman that lived in the house um, kind of was talking to my husband about it. He wanted to know if someone had died in the house. Then he told my husband he was speaking to something on a Ouija board. Mm. But he never came out and said anything was really bothering him. Um, we then rented the house on the other side of my mother-in-law's house that my husband owned because we were living with my mother-in-law. Uh, the gentleman rented out a room, but he had house privileges. We kept the house open for our going back and forth because my husband was a memorabilia collector of sports things. So we, we wanted to have access to go in and out of the house because that's where he kept his memorabilia. Um, the, first, the very first thing that happened that I experienced, we went over to the house. My husband opened, unlocked, because this was a locked room, unlocked the door to check on his sports things. And the, he had bobbleheads on the wall. And something or someone had taken the bobbleheads off the wall and put them on the ground in the form of a triangle. Now, the first thing you think of is the, the tenant had gotten into the room and was, was messing with the things. Because you don't think of anything being paranormal. You just think someone physically is, is doing these things. But the gentleman claimed he never went in the room. It was locked. So we just kind of let it go. But we kept a closer eye on what was going on in the house. Within a week, two weeks later, the gentleman started becoming uncomfortable in the house, wouldn't tell us why. But then one weekend, he just moved out. Uh, we went over there to clean the house. And while I was in there just looking, uh, there was a long shelf in the living room. And there were quite a few statues on it. And I glanced up there, noticing it needed to be dusted. My husband was in the other room. And within a blink of an eye, I turned my head and turned back. And all the statues on this, this uh, shelf were turned backwards. Hmm. So you know, when you first, when I remember thinking, did I see it right the first time? Because you think, oh, my eyes are playing tricks on me. So I told my husband and he said, oh, probably the tenant was just playing some type of joke or something. But that's when it really, really started. Things started happening day after day. Um, I went in to clean, like I said, and things from one room would be moved to another room. My husband thought at the time that his, his uncle had died in that house. So he thought maybe the spirit of his, his uncle was in the house doing things, letting us know he was still around. I didn't know. But you could say, if someone's with us, move something. And you could go in another room and come back, and a piece of furniture would be moved, or a lamp would be moved into the room. So it would interact, it would interact with you. It would, it would take, like, not take orders, but it would like, it was almost became like a game. Look what I can do. Mm hmm and that's actually the first few things that started to happen. Very non-threatening. It wasn't, you didn't have it come into the house and feel something evil or something dark. It was just like, almost like entertainment at first. Yes. And that's actually how they can trap you, I believe, is that they'll make you feel that it's a friendly ghost like Casper. Right. Yeah, right. And look what I, good, yeah. yeah, it's like, look what I can do. And you have to, you have to say it was amazing because at first it was amazing because it was like you could talk to something and it would do things, and it was just an amazing time at that point. Oh, I bet it was. And the other two houses, were they also affected or it didn't bother them? Uh, the middle house where we were living, things started to happen. What would happen is items that belonged to this gentleman in the rented house would start appearing in our house. Hmm. My mother-in-law was a very religious person, and next to her bed she had like a, a shelf and she had all different uh, religious uh, statues on it. And she would pray there every night before she went to bed. Things started being apported from this gentleman's house onto her, her shelf. It would be personal items, jewelry, underwear, socks, things that were his that no, no one physically was moving to, the, to our house, but they appeared. And just so the audience knows, apportation is, if I'm correct, a manifestation of uh, items? Is that correct? Yeah, right, it's without any of items or transportation, um, usually across great distances of an item from one location to another. Teleportation, essentially. Um, occasionally, though, you come across some, inter some particularly interesting phenomena, like ones being afforded through time, um, as, as such as the uh, like out of time artifact type kind of uh, kind of deal. Um, usually, indicative of, of a lot of paranormal activity and very, very strong paranormal activity, mm -hmm. a high energy level. What sort of entities are we talking about that can 
D- do a portation? Well, it's it's been known to happen through through some of the, the more basic hauntings, but usually it's indicative of something which is a little more sinister. Mm-hmm. Uh, talking demonic entities, um, some of the work done by Rosemary Ellen Guiley and by David Weatherly suggests that it could be gin related as well. Mm. Um, others, of course, suggest elemental spirits, uh, things of that nature, but it's usually something that's extremely powerful that can do it. Mm-hmm. Now, Deborah, did you ever at any time during this situation ever feel uncomfortable in either of these houses? Uh, no. I didn't feel uncomfortable. Like I said at the beginning, it was more of a, almost like a game. And there was, there was no, I didn't feel threatened at all. Hmm. Uh, my mother-in-law was very frightened of it. My husband was very frightened of it. My father-in-law from the very beginning was rather indifferent to anything that happened. When it started to change, when it, uh, we, at this time we were moving, we were going to sell the properties. Even before the, the entity was, was bothering us, we were going to move to a larger house together up, up on the hill, up in El Tloma and sell the properties. Um, so in the back of our mind, we were always thinking, well, we can move and get away from this anyway. Um, the only to, this is the last day when we were moving, we finally found a house. We were moving out. We moved out slowly because it was close by. Uh, this is the time when the entity actually started showing itself as being hostile. It was like, it was very upset that we were leaving and the night, the day that we were leaving, my mother-in-law and I were in the the house, her house in the middle. And we heard like a crash from the kitchen. We were in the bedroom packing the last box and we went out to the kitchen and the, all the cupboards on the walls had been ripped off the cupboards and thrown around the kitchen. Then there was like a a glass breaking from the bedroom where we had just been. And all the windows in that room had been blown out. And at that point it was like this feeling of, run you better get mm-hmm. out of here and i remember my mother and my mother-in-law and i grabbed that last box and ran out of the house and she never went in that house again we had hoped when we moved up to the new house that we were going to be safe that we moved away from it we thought we left it back there but first two weeks two three weeks up here at the new house it was fine quiet but it was, like i said we were almost like it was like waiting for the shoe to drop you were thinking are right, did we escape or you know are we safe and we thought, actually, we were. We thought, oh, everything's fine now. And then a picture was turned backwards. And we knew when the picture was turned backwards, it had come with us. Mm-hmm. And then everything started up at the new house. Yes. It, it almost seems as though it had attached itself to someone in your family. Do you think this was an actual demonic entity or was it more of a manifestation of negative feelings that, that sometimes can create a similar type of phenomena. Do you know, I wasn't that familiar with demons or negative activity. So I couldn't, I couldn't really make a judgment at the time. All I knew was we were being tormented by something we couldn't see. Um, it was just, it was scary. And it was the, when it started up here, it was really scary because we knew that we couldn't get away from it. That's when it was, you know, all you always think in the back of your mind, well, you can move and get away from mm-hmm. something. But once, once it followed us, we knew we couldn't escape. Mm-hmm. And Todd, I know you wanted to say something. Yeah, that, actually, that's an idea that I kicked around quite a bit. That was a manifestation of negative emotion, um, kind of like a, an uncontrolled semi-sentient tulpa or a thought form. Mm-hmm. Um, those have been known to, to be quite powerful. Um, in a lot of cases, extraordinarily powerful. So that's, that's just one of the ideas that I kicked around. But that, that was actually a, a good pull there. Like I said, it's, it almost seems as though it was attached to somebody. Was that was it specifically attached to anyone in your family that you later became aware of? Yes. It, well, I know if I would say attached, but its focus of its negativity was on my mother-in-law. Uh, it hated my mother-in-law. Why? It wanted her dead. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a very long, complicated story. Uh, the entity, once it came up to the new house, uh, not only started doing its, its nasty things with breaking things and, and carving symbols and things, it started writing to us on the mirror in soap. Oh, some love letters or I hate you letters, etc. <laughs> well, you know, it started out at negative and then it would go, go back and forth wanting to communicate and wanting to be mean. It was like, you know, depended on the day. Mm-hmm. But it's the, the first thing it said, and this was true, it wrote no escape on the mirror. Mm. 
and there was no escape. It was almost like it had flowers. I love you. I love you not. Right. That's it. Um, uh, the entity told me, and when I say told me a story, I mean the communication was the mirror. It didn't speak to me or anything. It wrote on the mirror and told me a story that I asked it why it, what it said that my mother-in-law belonged to him. I, I confronted the entity, told him, you, I will respect you. You will respect me. That's the way it's going to be because it got to the point where we couldn't get rid of it. We were living with it, and we had to do something. So I confronted it. It said and I left the bathroom, came back. After I told her, I said, you will not touch my husband. You will not touch my child. Uh, you will not touch Lee. And it wrote back, I will not touch the child. I will not touch your husband, but Lee belongs to me. And then it went. To, it told me a story that Lee had been promised to him in, a, in, a, in the past as a sacrifice. And the sacrifice never came to fruition. But he felt that she still belonged to him and he wanted her. And he was going to get her. Mm -hmm. When you speak of past, are we talking about a past life or the event in 1984? I past life long, long, long ago. He told me a story about a monastery and monks and uh, satanic rituals. And he, when he, the, the author that did the book almost made it seem like in the that this this being had a human presence in that past life, but that's not the way I interpreted it. I interpreted that he had a presence in the monastery and that he, when he said he walked the halls of the monastery, he didn't physically walk. He was in that monastery controlling things. Mm -hmm. Now, since you did bring up the book, whose idea was it to make it your account, a fictional account versus a non-fictional account? Actually, that was the author's. Um, the author was, is Joey Albrecht. She, um, I, had, I really, when I wanted to write the book, I didn't know which way to go. I just wanted my story told. Mm -hmm. I wanted people to know this really happens. Uh, she suggested, because I told her the whole story, that it was such a complicated story that two, two reasons why we should do it this way. We would be able to explain it better because there are some parts that are hard to explain that if she elaborated a little bit, people would be able to understand exactly what happened. And secondly, she thought it would appeal to a broader audience that people that would like these type of books be a broader audience that would enjoy the book. Uh, I just went with what I had no, no uh, knowledge about books or anything. I just mm -hmm. wanted the story told. So I went with what she suggested. Looking back now, are you satisfied with how it, it was played out your story? I know you said that some of the story is not accurate to your true story, but uh, are you mostly right. satisfied with how she wrote it? It's about 90% accurate. She elaborated on a few things and added a few things that weren't true. Uh, when I look back upon it, maybe I would have went a different route because I, I had problems. Anytime she, she didn't tell the truth, I would, we would go at it because <laughs> I wanted to know exactly what happened. So if I think back on it, maybe I would have went with the, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Mm -hmm. But I am satisfied with the book and the fact that it's 90% true. Everything that happened, happened. A few things she elaborated on, but it's, it's a true story. Mm -hmm. That's great for everyone to know because most people will want to read books. That's The majority of it's true. Mm -hmm. You can fictionalize some things. but Now, w when you found out that your mother-in-law, this thing wanted your mother-in-law, what did you say to her? Like, Hey, um, I I'm sorry to tell you, but we're going to leave you in this house with it because it wants you. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I was very close to my mother-in-law. I love my mother-in-law so much. She was a wonderful lady. She passed away in 2010, but she was a wonderful woman. And I wasn't going to let anything happen to her. My husband w was uh, not a very well man, so he couldn't protect her. My father-in-law d really didn't want to protect her. And I felt that if I didn't take care of her and protect her, that she would have died. So, no, I wasn't going to, I was going to not let the entity have her. We now know that this entity wanted your mother-in-law. Was she getting sicker by the moment, by the week, month? Yeah, you know, this is, the, the entity tormented her. I mean, it was all constantly. He, I don't think he wanted to kill her himself, you know, kill her. I think he wanted her to commit suicide or to have someone else kill her. Mm. I, that's, that's the way I felt. I don't think he was going to just grab her and kill her, although he did 
do some physical things to her to harm her. Uh, I think he needed her to commit suicide or have someone kill her. But he would, he made her life a living hell. He tormented her. She, he destroyed her clothes, her shoes. Or he t- took her wallet so she didn't have an identity. She couldn't have anything. Uh, he, he put booby traps on it. Like when she, her favorite chair, he'd put knives in it. Wow. So if she went to sit down, she'd sit on a knife. Or in bed at night, he'd prop, prop knives through the pillow so if she put her head down, she would be stabbed. We had it became common practice that we would never leave her alone, and we'd have to go with her before she would sit down and check everything where she sat so she'd be safe. We even had to be careful with her food because it started putting aspirin in her food. Mm. She was allergic to aspirin. She went to the hospital like three times, uh, swollen up like a balloon. Um, so it was a constant vigilance of protecting her. Mm-hmm. And all my time listening to ghost stories, even doing this show, I have never heard a story quite as horrifying as yours. I don't know how you went through it and remained intact with your sanity. The truth of the matter is, (laughs) sometimes I I wonder (laughs) too, but it came to the point where I felt that someone had to be strong. Someone had to be the one protecting the family. My husband couldn't. He wasn't physically able. Mm -hmm. So it was like, you forgot about being frightened. You forgot about everything except just protecting. And that actually, that was the mode I was in, like just protecting. Mm-hmm. And also, this entity was such an intelligent entity. It spoke all different languages. My mother-in-law was a very intelligent lady. She spoke like six languages. And one of the languages she spoke was Tobresh, which is a dialect of uh, uh, Sicilian with Albanian. And it's a dead language. My husband spoke it and she spoke it. Sometimes she would try to speak to my husband in this language so the entity wouldn't hear what she was saying. But then the entity would write an answer on the mirror answering what she said in Tobresh or if she spoke in Spanish or Italian. It it spoke all different languages. So no matter what she said, it knew just what she was saying. Mm, That's something. Now, during this time, did you ever bring in a priest or a demonologist? We brought in many, many people. We brought in, uh, the very first person we brought in was a priest. Now, it was, even at the beginning, it was hard. My mother-in-law didn't want anyone to know what was going on because she was embarrassed. She felt, for some reason, she felt she was being punished for some reason. She didn't even know why, but she thought she must be being punished by God that he would let something like this happen to her. And then she was all, we, the four of us were worried that people would think we were crazy. Because this was a time, this was 25 years ago, when people weren't as open-minded as they are now. Uh, Now you have all the programs with people that ghost hunt and they understand these kind of things do happen. Back then, if if you talked about this, you were nutty. So we were very isolated. And that's what the entity wanted. It wanted us to be isolated. It would, it was actually, it became control of the house. It was our master at the time. We, we couldn't do things without the entity allowing us to. If he didn't want us to use the car, he would destroy the car so we couldn't use it. Mm. If people came to the house, he would cause them to fight or to take things from them like we were stealing. So he isolated us. If we went out, like we went to visit, I remember once my, my mother-in-law's friend, he took the gentleman's wallet when we left and took it to our house and put it on the table. So it was like we took the gentleman's wallet. We couldn't call him back and say, by the way, we have your wallet now. So he isolated us, and that's the way he wanted us. What did you do? Keep the money and everything that was in it? Or did you mail it to the person? No, we mailed We put it in an envelope <laughs> and mailed it back to him. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been awesome well, they, if the entity got some gold from Fort Knox and put it in your house. Yeah, I would have liked that, but he didn't do anything really nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, be. Now, now what what's other types of things has he, uh, did this entity manifest in your house one of the most to me one of the most amazing things that it manifested it ported a spearhead mm. now it put it in bed with my father-in-law and it even said on the mirror it wanted my father-in-law to use this spearhead and it was it was metal it was you can see it was hand forged uh we took it to the museum in los angeles and had it looked at because we wondered where it had come from we knew it had been the entity had brought it he even told us he did they told us at the museum that it was uh, from the Belgian Congo area, that it was over 200 years old. And by the way it was sharpened and the way it was made, they could tell it was for rituals, not for hunting or not for, for killing in any way. 
and for warfare because it wasn't sharpened on the side, just the point. So they said it was it was probably used in ritual magic for from the shaman. Mm-hmm. And the entity wrote on the mirror that he wanted a blood ritual. Mm. And he wanted my mother-in-law's blood to be used, and my father-in-law was to do it. And I remember I took possession of this because I didn't trust my father-in-law with it. What? I still have it put away. <laughs> yeah, that's an and amazing piece. I remember I said to the entity, you're not going to use this, and you're not going to get my mother-in-law's blood. And it became so upset, it blew out all the windows mm. on the top floor of the house. Wow. Now, what struck me that you said just now that you did not trust your father-in-law with the spear. Did you think that he might have actually killed her? Well, during this time, uh, some things that happened that we haven't discussed. Um, one of the things that happened, we had had Ed and Lorraine Warren come to the house. And while Ed and Lorraine Warren were here, they did Ed did the rite of provocation. And the entity or whatever this demon was went into my father-in-law. Mm. And it's not that he changed his looks like, you know, you think, well, in these monster pictures that you see when people get possessed, they change their looks change dramatically. It didn't happen like that. He changed his mannerisms and his voice changed. Mm. He became stooped over his one arm curled into his chest. He dragged his other leg behind him. He confronted Ed Warren and it seemed like, I don't know if it was it before that, he was very indifferent, like he didn't care. There was no sympathy, no no need for him to try to comfort my mother-in-law. But it seemed like after this time, he became very secretive. Mm-hmm. And I was the only one that used to speak to the, the entity on the mirror because t- everyone else was afraid of Mr. Entity. I was talk to him. One of the reasons I would talk to him, if I spoke to him in the mirror and kept him up co- using his energy in conversation... He would stop destroying the house. He just literally destroyed our house. He gouged. He had a symbol. And it started right from the very beginning. It was a triangle, and it had a tail in the middle of the bottom of the triangle. And he put that symbol everywhere in the house, burned it into the walls, gouged it into the floors, cut up the rugs, the symbol. He destroyed, literally, really destroyed the house. From the morning to night, he would, he would just do nasty things. So... When I would talk to him on the mirror, and it seemed like when he used his energies or his energies were more concentrated on, on communicating, he didn't destroy as much. So I constantly would, would uh, communicate with him. Hmm. And did you ever look into that symbol to see if you could find a correlation between anything in historical documentation and the symbol? No, I, back at that time, there was very little I could look up. I didn't find anything. Todd, since then, has researched it. What did you find, Todd? Uh, unfortunately, this symbol's been plaguing me now for months. Um, the closest thing I, could, I, can, I can make uh, you know, heads or tails of it is, is that it's the entity's personal sigil, because I've gone through all the, the major texts looking for it, um, going back to the uh, Pseudomonarchia Demonum, the Ars Goetia, Le Megiton, all of the old texts. Going on. I've, I've gone all the way back to the Babylonia, Sumeria, Canaan, and tried to work my way forward. And the best that I've come up with, are, it does bear some resemblance to um, one demon in particular's personal sigil for Asmode. Um, it looks somewhat like an alchemical composite symbol, but in the end, I've never found anything exactly like it. Hmm. Huh. I'm just trying to imagine the symbol. Actually, do y'all have a picture of that somewhere? If you go That's online, if you go to, to uh, uh, DeadlyHaunting.com, Yes. They'll show pictures of all different things from the from the haunting. Oh, okay. And one of them is the spear and the the symbol. Yes, and I know Todd that you've written, I think, a two part article where you've shown the spear mm-hmm. and I believe it is the mirror where writings were appearing on. Uh, yeah, yeah, that spear is really interesting. Actually, I, I got to hold it physically and look at it. It is an amazing piece. Um, when Debbie had it examined, uh, they said it was about a little over, it was, they said it was over 200 years old. Um, based upon the other museum pieces I've seen, and uh, I've researched it pretty heavily, if you place it at about 250 years old, yep, from the Belgian Congo, and the, the cross hatching on it and the design match up exactly with what you said. It seems to be a ceremonial piece, mm-hmm. uh, not sharpened on the sides, sharp at the point, meant for piercing, uh, meant for bloodletting with the cross hatching that it has. And it's free of rust, um, hand-wrought iron. It's 
a, a marvelous piece and in great condition considering its age. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as though this entity went into the past and brought it in new condition and gave it to y'all. Exactly. It, it matches right. up with the definition of an out-of-place artifact or a oop art, as they call them, um, or in this particular case, an out-of-time artifact. Mm -hmm. Now, Deborah, do you ever feel... Well, first of all, do you still have these items that this Mr. Entity was m manifesting for you? Yes. Um, the pictures, we had different, we had pe all people from all over the world come to try to help us get rid of this entity. No one could. But they would come and they would say, now, take pictures and document everything. And mm -hmm. we would. And they couldn't get rid of it. The next people that would come would say, now, destroy all your pictures and all your notes because you're keeping it here. So <laughs> my husband, he was a hoarder. So I, when he passed away two years ago, I found in the closet he had kept some of the pictures. If we had kept them all, we'd have thousands. But he ha I have like over 200 pictures with the negatives of from over 25 years ago of pictures we took of the writing and of the destruction that he did. And I still have the spear. Once I took it away from my father-in-law, I put it away. And it's I have it safe so nothing can happen to it. Mm -hmm. Or it can't be used. You know, I was just thinking that are you ever afraid that this entity could reveal itself to you again? Because you do have the spear and other items that it gave to you. Right. It also gave me gifts. After it'd been here for quite a while, it would bring me things. Uh, one time we went to Sedona looking for help. And I remember we were in the car commenting how I would love to. I love rocks, any kind of rocks. I just love rocks. And I remember commenting to my husband, I wish we had time to go up to, I think it was Bell Mountain, to get a rock off Bell Mountain so I could have it. And when we got home in the back of the car was a large rock. It was like eight to 10 pound rock shape. It was almost the shape of a triangle. And the entity wrote on the mirror that he brought it because I couldn't go up and get it. So he brought me one. So it did, it did things like, it was like it, this, this entity. I know there are horrible things, but there was a part of it that was intelligent and it almost had a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. It would, I mean, I remember one, it liked to critique people that came to the house because we had hundreds of people come to the house to try to help us. And some of these people were very strange people, but we were desperate. And I remember one person came to the house and he was very weird. And Mr. Entity wrote on the mirror, throw a net over him. He's a nut. <laughs> I mean, he, this entity would communicate on two levels. Sometimes it would be very hostile and then sometimes it would be just wanting to communicate. It was it was it was it was a horrifying time, but it was an amazing time when I look back at it. Because it's been twenty five years since anything has happened. I can look back at it and the fear isn't there like it was. So I can look back at it and see really how amazing this was to be able to communicate with something for whatever it was, a demon, whatever it was, for five years and, and it's just, it was an amazing time as well as terrifying. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever it appeared, well, maybe it never appeared to you, but whenever it would start writing, et cetera, moving things, was there ever a chill in the air where the atmosphere got colder? Now, is that, that's funny because Todd and I discussed this. We had all the, the typical things of a haunting and a demons. We had the knocking. We had the sounds. We had the smells. But I never remember a cold spot. I never remember cold. Hmm. That's one thing I do not remember. That's unusual. Yeah, in that situation, um, most of the time when you're dealing with, with your wild the mill haunting, um, you get a lot of those cold spots. And the, the major belief right now, the prominent belief is that they're, they're taking thermal energy out of the air to, to, mani to make manifestations to, to display phenomena. Um, if, it, if there's no cold spots in this particular case, uh, that says something to me that it's generating its own source of energy, mm -hmm. possibly, or that uh, it's not based upon that, that same particular phenomena, that it's not, that it's not actually pulling energy out of, out of the air. Um, not really sure how much credence I place in the whole cold spots thing myself. Um, I can't remember the name of the researcher. But he was he was trying to figure out exactly how much energy it would take, uh, thermal energy mm -hmm. it would take to manifest uh, 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 like an apparition uh, to physical manifestation. And upon some calculation, he made the decision that it would be about 
the entire energy output of the sun for one full year to actually drain that kind of energy and manifest it in that kind of fashion. Mm. So I'm not sure how much how much credence that plays in the whole cold spot issue in the first place. Mm-hmm. I know you've done a lot of research in this particular case. What has stood out the most for you? Oh, without a doubt, it's the frequency and the intensity of the phenomena. Um, I just never heard anything like it before. Mm-hmm. Um, just with things happening daily with objects being moved, you know, heavy, heavy objects being moved, um, apportation. It's you know, all on top of the signs of, of a classic haunting. It's just a, a researcher's, you know, it's, it's just a, such a huge amount. That it, it's really difficult to, to find a beginning spot to begin researching in this kind of, in this kind of situation. It's there's just so much to go on. Mm-hmm. Now, Debbie, it was like we talked about before. It was specifically focusing on your mother-in-law, mm-hmm. and it, it seemed to love you for one reason or another. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I say love, but it seemed to. Well, like I communicated with it, and it it did seem to, like it brought me presence, but I didn't I didn't think of it as love me. I just thought of it as. I don't even know why it brought me presence. Maybe so I would keep communicating with it. I don't know. Yeah. It might have been a lonely demonic spirit. You never know. <laughs> poor me. Poor demon. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Now, did it ever show itself to you physically? Uh, itself, not physically, but it did manipulate something that formed into its head. Uh, we had uh, two people that came to the house. They were shaman. They came to try to help us find out what this was and get rid of it. Um, my mother, when this happened after about a year into this happening, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, whose bedroom and uh, sitting room and bathroom were upstairs, um, they had a, they couldn't stay up there anymore because the entity was it slashed their bed up, it destroyed everything. Mm. So they came downstairs and moved in with us. So the whole family lived in the the suite, the the master suite. That's where we all lived together because that's the only place we felt safe. The, it, it took over the upstairs. You could, when you went to go up the steps, as you started climbing the steps, you could feel its presence. So it, t- it took over the upstairs. It, that's where it lived. So the shaman went upstairs, and I went with him. They asked me to go with him. I went with them, and uh, they were doing rituals, and they, were, they had sage that they were um, burning and blowing around the room. And up on the, t- on the second floor, there's a door, and you open it up, and it goes into the attic. And they said that's where it was hiding from them. It was kind of didn't want to be bothered with them, so it went in the attic. So they opened the door, and I, I stood right there and watched all this. And they were blowing the sage into the attic, and they would blow it in, and then a second later, something would blow it out. And it, they went around for like five <laughs> minutes blowing it in and blowing it out. So finally they said, well, we're going to have to go in there and confront it. So they went into the attic area. I went with them. I stood right in the doorway and watched. The walls of the, the attic had uh, insulation, pink insulation on the walls. And they did some type of ritual and demanded that it show itself. And as I stood there, I watched. Then the, the um, insulation came off the walls and it formed itself into a huge head. This was like a five foot tall, just head though, just head. Mm. And I had the, the side view. I didn't see the front. I only saw the side. And... It wasn't this monstrous looking thing. It was a male. It was definitely male. That's what I perceived from it was male. Uh, very big, strong chin, high cheekbones, big nose. And it had a horn that where your ear is, it started there and did a circle and went out and then up and around and off the top of the head. And it just, it was there and it was like 10 seconds. And I remember staring at it. I just couldn't believe it. I just watched it, and then it slowly dissipated, and it, did, and the, it just collapsed. What would have been awesome is when it manifested its head, if it had actually started talking, I huh. am Mr. Entity. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been very, very strange. I mean, it was, it was amazing. I mean, I could close my eyes and picture that to this day. It's something I'll never wow. forget. I wish you had a picture of that. I wish I did, too. Oh, yeah. My God. I'm going to turn the lights on all night tonight and leave them <laughs> on. You're scaring me already. Sheesh. Well, okay. Let's 
how long did this last for until 1991, I believe? Yes. And how did you remove this entity? Because it, you've tried everything, and it just stayed around no matter what you did. Right. Well, then, uh, how we finally realized why it, why we couldn't get rid of it. There was a uh, famous in this area parapsychologist, Dr. Evelyn Paglini. Yes. And she, she came to the house. She's dead now. She just died a few months back. Um, she came to the house and the entity just hated Dr. Paglini. He called her filthy names. Mm. A lot of the people that came, most of the people that came, like I told you, he would like to critique. He would say they had no power, no juice. I'm not afraid of this one. The machine can't detect me. Little, you know, little snide things. Mm -hmm. But with her, he would, ab would verbally abuse her, call her filthy names. He just hated Dr. Paglini. And I remember one thing she wrote on the mirror. She'd write on the mirror to communicate with it. And she wrote at the bottom of the mirror, God protects us. And the entity from the very beginning wanted us to call him Prince. He told us to call him Prince, which we, I wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. So he, he crossed off, the entity crossed off God and put Prince protects us on the mirror. Hmm. And she would... She tried all kinds of things to get rid of it. She couldn't get rid of it. She finally said, well, the reason why you're not getting rid of this entity is someone in the house is giving it permission to stay. And if someone gives it permission to stay, it does not have to leave. Mm. And we finally, my father-in-law, like I told you, was acting peculiar. Yeah. He would sneak in to the, the bathroom, downstairs bathroom, and communicate with the entity without anyone knowing. And the reason I even know this is the entity told me. He said, he's coming in and talking to me, and then he's erasing the mirror so you don't know he's talking to me. Because the entity didn't like my father-in-law at all. Mm. So that's how I knew my father-in-law. My father-in-law actually wanted my mother-in-law dead. He wanted the entity to kill my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law was wealthy. She wasn't rich, but she was wealthy. And he wanted the money, and he wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. So he wanted her dead. So he wanted the entity to kill her. So that's why we couldn't get rid of the entity, because he wanted it there. So we finally convinced my mother-in-law, who was, she was the type that if she was married, she was going to stay married no matter what, no matter what the gentleman did. I kept, it took us a year to convince her that he had to leave or we couldn't get rid of the entity. So finally, she told him he had to go, and he moved out. When he moved out, the entity stayed. The entity didn't leave. It stayed. But... I started communicating. At this time also, we had a gentleman who was staying here, a researcher, who was a little peculiar. He was a very unhappy person. And he had seen how powerful this entity was. And he had it in his head that if the entity went with him when he left, that it could change his life. So he actually told the entity, he gave the entity permission to leave with him. I told Mr. Entity, I said, you have to go. You're not, you can't be here now. Dad's gone. We're, you're not going to be fed all his negative, his negative energy. We love each other, and I'm not going to let you touch Lee. And the entity wrote back, I don't want to go. And Gary gave it permission, and then the entity wrote about Gary, I will not work with an inferior being. But eventually, he decided to go with Gary. He said, oh, it is time to go now, Gary. You are now my servant. Hmm. And... He said, the last thing Mr. Entity said was, goodbye, my family. And that was 25 years ago almost. And not a thing has happened since then. And this entity considered you to be like a family. I, you know, I don't know. Was it, we were his family, like a play thing, like a, a person has a doll and it's his family, you know, a little kid. Or was, did he become like we, we, we had, he'd been with us for long, so mm -hmm. long we were his family. But if we were his family, why should he torment us? Why did he have to control us? I mean, that wasn't a relationship, a family relationship. Mm -hmm. That was a, a master and relationship. So I don't know if he said my family, like we belong to him, or if it was a fond farewell. I don't know. Well, you know, in a lot of families, you always have the black sheep, the weird one. Who doesn't always fit in, <laughs> always causing trouble. <laughs> so you never know. You don't. See, that's it. I don't know. There are so many questions I would love answered. I think, see, the, I think back, it was so long ago, and for 25 years, we never spoke of it. Because we, when it left, 
My mother-in-law refused to ever speak of it again. And my husband also, they were petrified of it. For all those, most of the years they lived in the bedroom, they wouldn't even come out. To, my, to the day my husband died, he slept with a nightlight mm. and wouldn't go out in the kitchen at night if it was dark unless someone was with him. I mean, we were all emotionally scarred. You never change. Once something like this touches you, you're, you're, you're changed and you never go back the way you were. So true. But, yeah, that, that is true. But it was gone and we didn't want it to come back, so we never brought it up again. Mm -hmm. And have you researched into what happened to this paranormal investigator named Gary? Yeah, he was a friend. I used a different name in the book because he is so peculiar. I don't want him involved in any way because he's a very strange man now. But he was actually a friend. He was a strange man, but he was a friend because he actually went through a lot of this with us. He experienced a lot of it. The entity didn't like him. And the entity, well, this, some of the things the entity used to cut his clothes. One time we were sitting at the kitchen table and we were having lunch. And we heard like clip, 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 clip. And I looked over at, at Gary and his hair was being cut. <laughs> you couldn't see anything cutting, but his hair was actually falling off his head. Wow. Oh, it, it, the things that happen are the most amazing. I think I look back at it and it's almost like a dream. You know, it's just, it's amazing. And I probably can't even remember half the things that happened because mm -hmm. it was so long ago. I hope it was a good haircut at least. <laughs> I don't know. He went right when he saw it was happening. He screamed and ran out of the house. So <laughs> I don't think the entity got to finish it. You, you can't beat a free, to hair, free haircut, you know. <laughs> oh my, this has been quite interesting. Now, Todd, we've been talking for quite a while now. What is your take on the whole situation? I know you've been researching this for how long now? It's about nine, about nine months. Nine months. Um, that's uh, about the time I first met Debbie is the, is the time I began to, to research it. Um, now I've been researching about 20 years with this particular case, about nine months. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, despite the familial ties, the, the personal ties between Debbie and I, if I would have heard the story straight out um, without any kind of corroboration, I would have had a really hard time believing it. I, mean, it's, I hate to say it, but there are some amazing, uh, amazing phenomena that if I wouldn't have had any kind of corroboration behind it, I, I don't think I could have believed all of it. It, it would have been very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. But I've had some correspondences with uh, some of the, the investigators who originally investigated the case, uh, Brian Hurst, Lloyd Arbach, and they've corroborated it down to a T. You know, they've, they're staunchly saying that, yes, this, in fact, did happen. You know, they, you know, they, they witnessed this, these phenomena actually occurring. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't think that they would stake their reputation on saying that something happened when it didn't. Mm. Um, but just as easily, you know, just as easily, what difference would it make to that? Yes. But, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's been, uh, I've, I'm pulling at threads with, with the research, essentially hoping that something will untangle the whole thing. But I, I've, I'm looking at the, the identity of the entity. I'm looking at the phenomena, each individual phenomena, and I'm researching it back. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's taken a full nine months and it could just quite as easily take years from mm -hmm. here. What's the possibility of you and Deborah collaborating on a book w once you've done enough research and you actually put together a more non-fictional, well-documented version of this encounter? Um, well, on, on I, my I part, I would love to work with with uh, Todd writing anything. A very intelligent man. Just a, a it's it's he's been such a help, such a comfort. Yeah, actually, I, I would love to. I, I hadn't really put a lot of thought into it up to this point, but yeah, that would that would be great. Uh, I think that would be a, a great book. But the the book, I, I, of course, I read the book um, that's out. But one of the the sticking points that I had was the fact that it was fictionalized. Yeah, you know, I can I can I, I can understand where a lot of the readers might say, okay, what parts real, and what parts fake? And to me, the actual accounts of what happened, the verifiable accounts. The ones where I've seen the pictures, I've spoken to people that have been there, are far more fascinating mm. than the fictionalized portions of the book. Just uh, by orders of magnitude, it's just 
it's hard to, to encompass the scope of exactly what happened within a book. Um, when these things are happening daily, it's really hard to, to try to, to convey exactly what had happened mm-hmm. you know, on a day-to-day basis. And what role did you say Rosemary Ellen Galley played in this with your research? Oh, I, I actually contacted uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley and um, along with David Weatherly. I knew that they were both doing research into the gin, and that was something I had heard a bit about it. I had heard on, uh, I think it was a radio interview or a podcast, I had heard Rosemary, Rosemary Ellen Guiley give a basic rundown of what her research for the gin had been. And I having just maybe been, I think maybe three weeks into my research into uh, Debbie's case, I wanted to get a fresh take on it. So I, I actually just contacted uh, her and David Weatherly and they both came up with about the same type of, uh, of uh, response to me, which is it could quite possibly be a gin. That's the thing is it's, I, I'm tried to go with my research from the most likely to the least likely scenario as to the identity of the entity. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not sure if Debbie's mentioned it, but there was actually a really big clue written on the mirror that really struck a lot of, that hit a real big bell for me. Mm. And what was that? That was the name of the entity itself. Oh, what was the name of the entity, Debbie? It, it liked to do magical symbols also, as well as words. And this one day it did a, a wheel in the middle of the mirror with spokes and it wrote names around all the spokes on the in, inside the wheel. Then it put names in each corner and then on the bottom of the wheel <clears throat> underneath it wrote B A A L. Now that's a, that's a name that immediately when I saw that, I, I knew that it was something big because that's a name Bale. Uh, it's pronounced Bale is a name that it conveys a lot of weight in metaphysical circles. Uh, it's, it's a lot of history behind that, um, going all the way back to ancient Canaan, where it's, uh, the, they had the god Baal as the chief uh, as the chief deity. Um, later on, as most as history tends to progress, a lot of the the gods of the old become the demons of the new, and it, uh, the name reemerged again. I'm trying to think, maybe 1570s, I think, in a uh, a book called the uh, Pseudomonarchia Demonum. Um, I'm trying to remember um, the false hierarchy of demons, I believe mm. is what it's called. And the first name of the listed demons in that book is actually Baal. Um, maybe another 150 years later, that name emerges again in a book called the Ars Goetia. It's the first book of the Lesser Key of Solomon. Once again, First demonic name that's listed in there. So that's it's um, also that that does have a tie-in to the writing on the mirror that said "Call me Prince." Mm-hmm. Uh, Baal is listed as being one of the one of the seven princes of hell. Wow, I'm gonna have to ask Rosemary Ellen Galley about some of this stuff because she will be on the air with us next week. Oh, great. yeah. She she actually I I contacted her briefly and she's the one who. Uh, her work is actually the one that inspired me to think possibly, if not, it's not this goetic spirit, if not a demon, could quite just possibly be a djinn, mm-hmm. which is another whole line of research have gone down. But yeah, that was sparked off by hearing her um, on a, I'm not sure if it was a podcast or on the radio, but uh, hearing her uh, interpretation of that. Mm-hmm. Now, for the audience, what, what is a djinn? Uh, Jinn is a Middle Eastern spirit. A lot of the uh, older occult texts don't talk a whole lot about them. Um, they're mentioned in the Quran. Um, they're mentioned in, in some of the older texts as being spirits of, as where as, as where man is, is a, of earth and fire, a jinn is of, of air and fire. It's a, a different class of spirit, much like a human being, Possibly some sort of, in, uh, with more modern take on it, could be some type of dimensional being. Mm-hmm. Uh, great power. Um, very similar to humans, but in other ways, very alien, but very, very powerful. Mm. Um, of course, you know, when you, th- when you hear the word jinn, you think genie. And that's uh, what, unfortunately, has become of, uh, of that 
the ancient lore mm-hmm. about it. It's been reduced to you know, granting three wishes, magic lamp kind of deal. But the actual origins are, are pretty rich. Now, if a gin was anything like an I Dream of Genie, I would love to have one. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, I don't think I'd want one. Totally. <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> now, D- Deborah, before this whole event began with you, did you ever experience anything paranormal related or did you have any interest in the paranormal? The interest I had was just as entertainment. As for anything paranormal, I think I saw a ghost in Fort Oswego back in New York many, many years ago. Mm. Other than that, nothing. Mm-hmm. So it, pretty much something like the Twilight Zone, et cetera, those types of shows you'd be interested in. Right. And I, I liked them. I enjoyed them. But I always saw them as just being entertainment. Yeah. But I was open-minded. I wasn't saying, oh, this stuff couldn't happen. It was like, show me it and I'll believe it. Mm-hmm. And you got showed, didn't you? I certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> well, Deborah, Todd, I've definitely enjoyed this conversation with you all. I do have a question that has nothing to do with the book, and, and I'll put it out for both of you. I do this during the show. And if you don't have an answer, that's fine. But hypothetically, if time travel were real here and today, where would you go to and what would you do? You think about that for a second. Go ahead, Debbie. Let me, let me, get it. Let me think about I, that for a minute. I would love to go back to Egypt in the time of the pyramids. Mm. Is there anything you'd like to do while you were there? I Just explore. Just learn. Yes. And see how the pyramids were made. Right. Just see the what happened back then. What it just that's a time period that really interests me. Mm-hmm. I would love to see exactly what their gods were if they were fictional or mm-hmm. if they really existed in some form. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta say, Egypt's always had a big pull for me, so that would be one of my one of my picks right there for sure. And I'm I'm a huge Egyptology buff. Mm-hmm. Uh studied the religion of you know, of ancient Egypt for a, a pretty long time now. But I don't know. It, I might be tempted to to go Europe mid seventeen mid seventeen hundreds. Hmm. Just that whole time period tends to to call to me a bit as well. Just to study the architecture, mm-hmm. the, the architecture and just the the people in general. <clears throat> mm-hmm. A lot of important historical figures emerged from that era. And just just to walk the streets, I think would be great. Oh yeah, to, to take it all in. Mm-hmm. Now, Deborah. Uh- if this entity would have had a physical form in the earlier years, I imagine you might have said, I'd go back to when it was a physical person, just beat the living you-know-what out of it. <laughs> I really don't think I'd want to get it mad, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely enjoyed this conversation with you all. Is there anything that either one of you we like to discuss with the audience right now your website, upcoming works, etc. Well, if they have, uh, they can go to a deadlyhaunting.com, and if they're interested, they can see the pictures because to see the pictures, it just makes it you can understand it better to see the writing and to actually know something that you couldn't see was communicating and see the spear that was brought for a blood ritual. I to me. It's it's absolutely fascinating. Even though I experienced it, I still look at these pictures and the spear with awe. Mm. Also, don't I also the uh, the Facebook page and the Twitter account as well. Uh, great ways to get in touch with Debbie right there. Um, direct line of communication does. Um, and for P- anybody that's up there as well. For anyone that's going through something like this, all I can tell them is don't isolate yourself. Don't be afraid to tell people about it. Because that's what we did, and and that makes it even worse. Mm-hmm. You have to have some allies, some people that will will be there for you. When you when you isolate yourself, it's it's just it makes it even worse. So if this is happening to you, don't be afraid to tell people what's happening. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, like I said, I definitely enjoyed this conversation with you. I know we were supposed to have done it twice now, <laughs> and. I apologize for having to reschedule it. And, and Deborah, I hope everything is fine with you and whatever was going on previously. Yes, it's good. the situation is getting better. Thank you. Well, like I said, I've said this many times already. I've enjoyed the conversation, and 
I hope you each have a great weekend and a great holiday as well. That goes. Thank and you. thank you very much for allowing us to be on. Thank you.